to this um, presentation, I'll say, by Molly Crabapple on art in the age of fascism. Uh, we are not new to this concept, having lived through both covert and overt times of fascism for most of our lives. Um, I feel a special bond with uh, Molly because she was born in the year in which the women of Lahore were demonstrating on the Mall against the discriminatory laws that were being brought in by General Ziaul Haq. They got beaten up and arrested for what was a very peaceful demonstration. And that has been, in a way, um, a marker for the work of artists in Pakistan after that. I think that was a turning point, really, in which there was a realization that there could not be a compromise with authority. I think that is not something that is new to what you do, Mali. Uh, I should say very briefly that to really know her and her work, uh, you will need to go into the various sources of information that we have. Uh, at this point, it's enough to say that she's an artist and a writer and a troublemaker. We love all those descriptions. Um, she, if I can steal a little bit out of what she's going to say, um, as a kind of framework, she says, under pressure, countries are turning inwards, turning towards strong men, looking for someone to blame. We know that very well. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, she'll be talking about her work, also the context in which she looks at her work and the world which we are living through. It's especially important at this moment in time because of recent events, both in her home country, which is America, and the rest of the world. Um, her illustrated memoir, Drawing Blood, came out in 2015. She has been prolific before that and after. Just before you start, I'd just like to quote something that you have said, that under such circumstances, work and love as a two constants in life. So that is probably, without your knowing, the title of a poem by Fares Ahmed Fares, one of the beloved poets of our era, who said, kuch ish kiya, kuch kaam kiya. I worked a little, I loved a little. So, Molly, it's all yours. I am so... I'm so honored by that introduction. And in truth, uh, justly, we should, we should be co-presenting our art together, but I, um, I will speak on in this slot given to me. I, I just want to say before I start, though, how honored I am to be in Lahore. And um, also, if one more person tells me I'm brave for being here, they should stuff it, because you guys live here, and I'm just so privileged to see your beautiful city. It's perhaps apropos that I am speaking about art and fascism. I was going to give this talk on Sunday, and then two bombs went off. They were inspired by a violent religious fanaticism that feeds and is fed by the racist war machine that has been enacted in and that it's taking over even more, my country. The festival was forced to shrink to a single day, and so here I am on Saturday, speaking to you. I wish I could give a talk like some of the others at the festival about courtesans or Darjeeling tea or poetry or all of the crystalline, beautiful, miraculous things of our world. I'm just an artist after all and I love beauty. But I'm an American and after this election, American means I've joined the unenviable club of nationalities that because of the events happening at home are, when abroad, impelled to speak out about our national pathologies. To use some cliches, we Americans watch the news with something in between whiplash and shell shock. The last week, 
a woman went to court to bring a case against the man who beat her. He called the immigration police and had her dragged away. The most eminent newspapers in our country are banned from press briefings, while a racist blog run by, which was formerly run, or perhaps currently run, we don't know, by the president's main advisor gets full access. Arizona recently passed a bill that allows protest organizers to be charged with rioting if police even suspect the protest might cause economic damage. Muhammad Ali's son was detained at the airport and interrogated about his religion. The president is advised by Steve Bannon, a man who will not send his kids to school with Jews, who believes that successful Asian immigrants should be banned as they are some sort of threat to his imaginary white culture, and who thinks that every 80 years, civilization needs a giant global war, just for fun. I wish I could talk about, write about, or draw about anything other than the bloated tangerine that is in the White House, and yet here we are, and here I am. A bit about me. I am an artist and a journalist. I got my start drawing in nightclubs for the depraved New York rich. Every night I would capture the toughness and the glamour of acrobats, dancing girls, artists, and sex workers. These men and women were as sharp and as glittering as diamonds, and they gave me the most real education I've ever had. About six years ago, I began working as a journalist. Since then, I've covered America and the Middle East. I have a rather unique niche. I write, but I also use my sketch pad, much like a photojournalist might use their camera. I've drawn the refugee camps in Greece, where despite the hundreds of millions of euros flooding in to help refugees, people sleep in tents in the snow. I've covered Gaza when Israel shelled. I've had my work looked over by the military censors at Guantanamo Bay. I've written about the impossibly brave prisoners who blew the whistle on abuses in solitary confinement units in Pennsylvania, and reported on workers in Abu Dhabi who are paid 21,000 rupees a month to build the great museums of the future. In Dubai, I once asked our future orange president why he paid the workers building his golf course so little. His mouth shrank very small, but he did not answer. In the sickly lead up to our election, I drew the media spectacle of the Republican National Convention where people who knew nothing about the larger world celebrated the coronation of a man who promised to radically shrink our world and everyone else's as well. I started combining art with journalism because I wanted to take art out of the studio, out of the gallery, out of the rich collector's home, and to bring it into the mud and blood of the world. I wanted to prove that even at a time when every historical event was accompanied by a million iPhone photos. Visual art, drawn by hand, still had something to say. After the election, I, like many people in America, felt that I had been punched in the gut. And of course, this was doubly true for artists. The writers, the painters, the musicians I knew felt futile. It was not just Trump. It had been building up for a long, long time. Trump's presidency is just the showiest example of a global love affair with fascism. He might be a soft little rich boy, but he's a bloated pea in the Duterte, Erdogan, Putin, Modi pod. Under pressure, countries are turning inwards, turning towards strongmen, looking for someone to blame. They are dropping bombs and hardening borders, launching raids and building walls. This didn't start November 8th, 2016. It's been going on for years. Last June, the great Kawali singer Amjad Sabri was murdered in the same week that a white supremacist murdered the humane British MP, Joe Cox. Their deaths seemed part of a great shrinking of the world into one crueler, pettier, stupider, and more violent. A world where machine gun towers seal off borders. Where kids drown in the Mediterranean. Where fanatics murder artists and where orange donkeys trade in fear. 
what could art do against that? When I pulled myself out of the post-election stupor, I decided that the first thing that we could do and the first thing that we must do is we must realize what we are up against. There's this false dichotomy set up. It's set up by these strutting, puffing, preening strong men all over the world. They divide their countries like this. On one side, there's the real people. On the other side, there's the fake people. The fake people might be um, ethnic minorities, they might be impoverished refugees, they might be you know, decadent urban elites. But the real people, well, the authoritarian paints a fine picture of the real people. The real people are the supposedly decent, humble, pious, patriotic, but most importantly, they were silent until the moment the authoritarian stepped onto the stage. At this point, they exist primarily as the authoritarian's supporters. They wave flags, but he is their voice. You, the American people, are our last line of defense against the media's hit jobs, Trump wrote in an email last week. The media are not the people. Neither are those people the people who did not vote for Trump. To the authoritarian, artists and writers and musicians are never, ever, ever real people. We are always the fake, impure, decadent, disgusting elite. That's their lie and that's their line, but the bad news is, sometimes it's true. Historically, artists and power have gone together like butter and bread. We are the gilders of lilies, the court painters of Versailles. All too often, artists, and I mean especially visual artists here, I mean my people, we have been like Fabergé egg makers pretending to be revolutionaries. We say a lot of liberal things, but in a language that only the most expensively educated can understand, and in rooms that cost more than most people's weekly wages to enter. I get it, and I know where I'm standing. The powerful people serve delicious buffets. I too realize that as I'm saying this, I'm speaking in a city where every school is mounted by snipers and walled off by sandbags, and quite necessarily so. This is a city where yesterday morning I watched the courage of the young women and men at their art university who walked past armed guards into a space where they can learn to make movies and paint miniatures. In Istanbul, a city uh, that I love and where I spend most of my time that I'm not spending in my hometown, Musicians, cartoonists, and journalists are all rotting in jail. The stakes are high, I know that, and they grow higher each day. The thing is, for art to mean anything under authoritarians, whether these authoritarians are governments or merely the men with the guns, it cannot spend all its time playing into their greatest trope. Artists cannot ensconce themselves in wealthy or even liberal enclaves. They cannot cede public space to the bigoted, to the craven, to the idiotic. Art must go out into the streets. It must speak to all classes of people, in all sorts of communities. It must break out of the art world. Because the world is too big, and art is too vital for any art world to contain it. It cannot keep being a mere status marker or luxury object. Bloated strong men want to say that artists are an irrelevant elite. We need to prove them wrong. Champion working class artists, writers, and musicians, and make art in spaces, ways, and languages accessible to working class people. Art is for everyone. All people want beauty, irregardless of class. When in 1912, textile workers struck in Lawrence, Massachusetts, they did not only demand bread, they demanded roses. In American prisons, incarcerated people who can draw make cards to sell to fellow inmates so that those inmates can have something beautiful to give to their kids outside. In the Domiz refugee camp in northern Iraq, one way Syrian refugees make money is by painting murals on the walls of their neighbor's shacks. The art that working class people make and that they love 
is so beautiful and so vital, but so often devalued. And other sorts of art are kept beyond their grasp by either literal or figurative barriers. Art must be everywhere and for everyone. Our enemy wants to lock us in a box, and I will be damned if we willingly jump inside it. Art must be braver. Art must dare more. Art must be both a refuge and a weapon. Tatiana Fazli Lizade is an artist um, that I know from New York and is one of the most brilliant artists I know. Uh, she's a street artist, and she's known around the world for a series of portraits um, called uh, Stop Telling Women to Smile, which is almost an informational campaign against street harassment. As she interviews women about the foul and harassing comments that they get on the street when they walk home or to work every day, then she paints the women's portraits looking strong, and she writes the comments beneath. And then she paints the portraits on the walls of the neighborhoods where the women are harassed. After the election, Tatiana went back to her hometown in Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is a state that went big time for Trump. It is the reddest of the red states. Tatiana painted the entire wall of a building with portraits of her friends, with beautiful black, Persian, Latina women and men. Over them she wrote, America is black. It is native. It wears a hijab. It is a Spanish-speaking tongue. It is a migrant. It is a woman. It is here, has been here, and it's not going anywhere. The men and women Tatiana painted stare right out of that wall. Their eyes pierce bigots. They see right through them, right on their own home turf. And for people from the communities targeted by Trump, it is a powerful gesture of solidarity. I see you, her mural says. I have your back. Some of the best art is threatening art. But art threatens no one as long as it is entombed in safe spaces where only those who agree with it will see. Worse, as long as it stays there, it remains inaccessible for those isolated rebels who need it most. Art needs to be in the world, whispering, screaming, seducing, and mocking, instilling us with empathy, showing us the world is far more complex, painful, and dazzling than we ever previously imagined. The art shows of mine that have meant most to me haven't been the ones that hung on the walls of galleries. They've been when people held my art as protest signs on the street. Maybe you think I'm putting too much responsibility on art or I'm being too harsh on artists. After all, these are dangerous times and the pen is not mightier than the sword, let alone the predator drone. Our books do not stop bullets, and our paintings cannot redraw their way through prison walls. But as disappointment and violence spread, the antidote is a generosity that art at its best can inspire. Art is hope against cynicism, creation against entropy. To make art is an act of both love and defiance. And though I'm a cynic, I believe these things are all we have. Another note. Art is vital in times of authoritarianism because demagogues attempt to use the methods of art for their own ends. Many people, American and abroad, looked at Trump's election and they asked, uh, don't Americans know? Don't they know he's a con man? That his promises are physically impossible? That he will alienate the world and tank their economy? That he negates every fine truth and, every transparent, and makes transparent every lie that America has told about itself? What is wrong with you? You, the rest of the world, asked America. And what is wrong with us? We Americans asked ourselves. How can you, how can we, be so irrational? What these viewers, both inside and outside the country, don't realize is that demagogues do not appeal to rationality. Sure, they might promise a job or infrastructure improvements, and they might even deliver, sometimes, for a while. But they offer something much grander, something freighted with drama, with pageantry, and with myth, something that sweeps people out of their atomized irrelevance and makes them pieces of a great machine. Something that makes them not merely resentful citizens 
who see the culture changing and mistake others' equality for their own disenfranchisement, something that alchemically transforms them into warriors on the side of right. Demagogues offer a story. In a chaotic world, many people want two things, identity and daddy. They long for a leader who promises not just to keep them safe, fed, emotionally validated, but to accomplish these things by punishing an imagined other, the other, the impure, foreign, unreal source of all of the homeland's humiliations. Depending on this country, the other might be black, Kurdish, Mexican, gay, dancing at a nightclub, doing drugs, or wearing a hijab. She may be an impoverished refugee or a decadent urbanite, but she is always looking down her nose at the decent demagogue-supporting majority, and she is always laughing. Of course, that silent majority doesn't exist, and neither does that other. These are stock figures in the authoritarian's playbook, substitutes for solutions in our complex, impure, and interwoven world. Economic justice is just the first step to beating fascists, orange-colored or otherwise. But the second step? On the page, on the walls, in the streets, we need to fight for each other, every last one of us, and not to tolerate. I hate that word. One tolerates painful shoes. But to proudly say that this world belongs to all of us and that we are not going anywhere. Ethno-nationalists are escaping from neoliberalism's cracks, just like they once crawled forth from the rot of 19th century empires, singing the same false and bloody tunes. In art and in life, we must write better stories. In this goal, we have one advantage. History is on our side. The stories authoritarians tell are ones of dichotomy, pure, impure, citizen, illegal, first world, third world, secular, religious, Muslim, Christian, black, white, us, them. Borders reinforced by razor wire, hard lines delineating irreconcilable contradictions, boundaries hammered onto the flux, the joy, the mess, and the chaos of our, con of our connected, complicated world. Their stories are simple, one people, one empire, one leader. That's the quote Hitler made famous, one. To give themselves legitimacy, authoritarians love to point to a simpler past. They love nostalgia. Think of Trump's Make America Great Again, of Putin's revived Russian Orthodox Empire, of Modi's Hindutva chauvinism, of Erdogan's neo-Ottoman fetish, of ISIS's tomb-like Islamic state utterly devoid not just of minorities, secular people, and visible women, but also of all the art, learning, scholarship, beauty, and culture that Islamic civilizations have bestowed upon the world. In these versions of history, there are no religious minorities, no gay men, no uppity women. Demagogues whisper stories of a long ago golden time when men were men, women were subservient, all members of the populace were of the same color and creed, or else so oppressed they didn't matter, and most of all, when everyone knew their place. To them, the world right now is depraved confusion. The past was neat, simple, clean. In pursuit of this past, they justify their radical narrowing of the present, their hammering away of difference, their travel bans, their border walls, their censorship and their bombs. The thing is, guys, their vision of the past, it, it's wrong. This world, theirs, ours, is an interconnected one and it always has been. Thomas Jefferson celebrated the first iftar in the White House. And the Mughal Emperor, Akbar, had Jesuits debate Buddhist monks. The Spanish I barely know from my Puerto Rican family is laced with Arabic traces of 800 years of Muslim presence on the peninsula, and also laced with Taino, traces of the indigenous people of the island that the Spanish would kill en masse. Our histories are interwoven. Our DNA is intermingled. Our cultures are mixed, and purity is a lie. We are, and we have always been, impure. And art, 
art operates best and it comes best from these places of impurity, of blurring, of mixture, and of flux. Demagogues might concoct history. They might take a stab at storytelling. They might try their hand at the dark magic of images. But their purity fetish renders them sterile. They can't make real art. All they get is propaganda. Yesterday, I saw something that reminded me of how art, even at a distance of hundreds of years, has the power to cut off authoritarians' lies. The Shish Mahal in Lahore Fort is one of the most dazzling places I've ever seen, and you forgive me for my, my tourist here, but it is, it truly is. The, the countless mirrors, mirrors, each of which once cast the flickering and tricky candlelight that once repeated the colors of Kathak dancers' costumes. Beneath the mirror work are a series of small frescoes. One of them shows a, a blue figure, unmistakably a Hindu god. Demagogues in America and demagogues in the Muslim world would pretend that Islam is a monolith, incapable and intolerant of diversity. The art on this wall, in front of which a Muslim empire once relaxed, shows what total lies they spew. There is no pure past and there is no separate other. We built this world together and it is ours even if it burns around us. We remind ourselves with these artistic stowaways from past times. And of course, the Shish Mahal was a place for royalty. But with art, we can construct new and more inclusive paradises. Art is just one small piece, of course, in what must be a global, cross-border, cross-class resistance to fascism. Farmers, lawyers, medics, all much more important than people like me. Yet we must sing songs, write books, and paint walls in the colors that show our complicated presence. And maybe we won't win, but our art will still exist as reminders for a more open future. And maybe we will win. And to win, all of us must play our parts, artists included. Thank you. Call yourself crab apple? <laughs> no, that was a nickname given to me by an ex-boyfriend. He thought I was small and sour. <laughs> it's true. Um, you say that um, you know the dichotomy is that there are these strutting, puffing, strong men um, that have captured so many world governments. We know that well, as you do indeed today, as a citizen of the United States of America. Um, but then, you know, as you also said, people want beauty. And there is a basic contradiction here. Um, I just like to, um, you know, you, I, I've been through where you have been, and you mentioned it yourself. You've been in Turkey. You've taught yourself Arabic, uh, though your Turkish sucks, you say. Um, but, um, and you have been in Gaza. I just want you to capture for us um, your motivations, your experiences in these two places, Istanbul and Gaza. And also, perhaps we would like you to add Lahore eventually to this space. Well, I have a very different relationship with Istanbul and with Gaza. I have been to Gaza only once, unfortunately, whereas Istanbul in some ways has become my second home over the last year and a half. I had to commute there to do my, my next book. Istanbul is one of uh, the great cities of the world, and it always has been. It's a city that is obviously a city soaked in blood and in empire, so many empires. It's a city that has been filled with refugees, whether they were refugees uh, fleeing the Russian Revolution or whether they were currently the refugees fleeing Syria. It's a cliche to call it a crossroads, and I, I won't uh, butcher, um, butcher its history with such a simplistic word, but 
Whenever I have visited there, I felt like I was on the edge of where history is happening. It's also a city that has um, the most privileged street cats in the world. Honestly, they have uh, all the benefits of uh, domestication. They get to eat you know, steak and stuff, but then they get to like run off and have sex in the middle of the street and climb on buildings and be bad. So I appreciate this about them too. In Istanbul, one of the most disturbing things that has happened over uh, since I started visiting was that the, um, pres the president, Erdogan, has taken a country that was, you know, a problematic in some ways, but um, thriving democracy, and he's reduced and he's reduced and he's reduced um, public space and the space for opposition until now uh, that head of um, the second most popular opposition party is in jail on utterly spurious terrorism charges, and uh, the wife of one of my friends, who's a middle school art teacher, was on a government watch list because she signed a pro-peace petition. It's a, play, a city where many people, many people I love, are, are forced to um, be because they're, they're refugees and they can't go anywhere else. Europe has certainly shut their door to them. But it's also a city where space is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And um, it's just such a marvelous city with such marvelous people in it. And so I, I deeply hope I deeply hope that this, this trend reverses. My relationship to Gaza was very different. I went once in 2015 to report on the aftermath of, um, the, um, of Operation Protective Edge, which was Israel's invasion of Gaza. And uh, when I was there, I got to experience Israeli shelling firsthand. There's um, an interesting little scam that uh, groups that are opposed to Hamas work out, which is that they um, fire what is called a rocket, but would be more accurately called um, a long pipe with just enough explosives to uh, get it into Israel proper. They fire that, it hits an empty field, um, you get a space of damage about as large as one of these uh, medallions on the carpet, and then Israel goes and shells Gaza, and they go bomb some um, Hamas infrastructure because they hold them responsible for all the rockets. In Gaza, the most um, visceral feeling is one of claustrophobia. It's so small, and every two years, Israel bombs it. And they make it smaller. They make the space that you can live in smaller. It's a place where people uh, live in the ruins of their homes. But it's also a place of uh, some of the most profound uh, defiance that I've ever witnessed. One of the images that I drew there was of um, this bombed out building. And in Shujaia, uh, the destruction is, it's not just the destruction of bombs. It's not just the destruction of tanks. It's also the destruction of bulldozers that came in later. It's a complete leveling. So there's this building that's, you know, just hanging on the last threads, and in front of it there's all this rebar, and if you've ever seen a rebar after a bombing, it's a very evil-looking substance. It looks like, like snakes. It's all twisted and sharp and black. You can imagine, why is there a drone, dear lord? What sort of dystopia are we in? Can someone shoot it? They fine. Get after you. All right, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll continue. I knew I, was, I knew I was what I was about to talk about, and <laughs> decided to steal the show from me. So there's this bombed up building and there's this twisted, evil looking rebar. And then there are guys that are straightening the rebar uh, with very, very, very primitive tools. Um, just really like, like hand cranks, you know, weights, rocks. And uh, they're doing that because Gaza is under blockade. And so they have to repurpose this rebar to try to rebuild. And I was just looking at this, these men working under this hot sun, straightening this, this evil looking material, turning it into something to reconstruct people's homes, and I was like, is there any better symbol of defiance in the world than this? And so I drew that. Well, um, and, and yes, I would, I would love to draw Lahore. And actually, I, if you look in uh, your copies of Newsweek, I have two drawings that I did. Um, they're of, um, they're of uh, the Royal Mosque and Dada Darbar. I hope to um, draw more intimate scenes as well. Well, um, one is looking forward to your book on Turkey. Since uh, Erdogan is uh, our leader's new best friend, so we are keen to hear the other side of the narrative, um, uh, which we don't get very often. Um, Gaza too, because I think Palestine is um, just a thought, an idea that is very close to our hearts, uh, but we also see it receding in the, the priorities that the world has at the moment. 
And what, what determines where you go next? Sometimes it's um, near opportunity. Uh, for, I decided to go to Gaza because I was in it. I was in Palestine for a literary festival, and I was able to um, kind of uh, talk my way into getting the right paperwork to go in. Whereas other places, uh, for instance, I did a, a big investigative piece on a migrant work in Abu Dhabi, which is uh, the reason that I uh, no longer uh, can uh, transit through Dubai. And um, <laughs> I, I did that piece because in New York, um, the Guggenheim, which is a museum we have there, was building a branch on Sidiad Island in Abu Dhabi. And a lot of um, artists from around the world, like from Bangladesh, from Lebanon, were refusing to have their work shown in this um, museum when it was built because of um, the labor conditions. And so I started investigating, and then I, I just started pushing and pushing, and finally I got a contact in, um, in Abu Dhabi, which was a, a local journalist. Um, and him and um, this other extraordinary young man, a young uh, Pakistani man, who um, had only graduated high school, he, but he had taught himself several languages, and who um, was um, basically um, fixing and translating for all manner of major international media, and who, as far as I know, only wasn't caught because um, Abu Dhabi is such a racist place, they couldn't imagine that a working class Pakistani um, young man could ever do such a thing. Um, I, met, I met those two, those two extraordinary people, and they, um, they took me around, and together we, um, we, we, inv we investigated a piece. So sometimes it's, um, it's luck, sometimes it's something, it's something that strikes in front of me. But um, the main, I suppose, things that catch me is I'm, I'm not interested in telling stories of victims. I'm not interested in telling stories of like, oh, look at the poor people. I don't like this. I think it's a terrible trend in American journalism. It's degrading. It is um, undignified. It uh, strips the humanity and the strength and the resilience away from poor people. I, um, I like telling stories of people who maybe um, are being done um, or maybe you're getting a raw deal from the world and maybe being oppressed by the world, but are fighters. That's the stories I like to tell. And I hope we'll make it a habit of um, coming back here too. Um, I think we can now open the, the floor to questions. Um, do we have a mic right here? Thank you so much. Um, for your presentation, made me feel like going home and starting a protest, actually. <laughs> I have a very practical question. You as an artist, more than as a writer, can you or do you entirely refuse um, market pressure? I have a kind of um, strange niche as an artist. Many artists they, uh, who are fine artists, they make all their living selling through galleries. And when you make all your living selling through galleries, um, your prices are very high, and that means only a very small amount of people in the world can afford them necessarily, um, which means that to a certain extent, your work has to appeal to very rich people. Unless you live in a humane country with grants, but I, I don't, so that's how it works in America. Um, but because I um, do uh, illustration and I do um, animation and I do a whole variety of work, um, my market per se is um, much, much more spread out. And um, if one aspect of the market uh, is telling me to do something that I find reprehensible, I can uh, just tell it to jump into the lake. Uh, this also goes for like, do you pay attention to where your work ends up, like in certain collections? Um, no, I I should. I mean, I I, I I guess I. I mean, I have I have some people I'm very um, who I really admire have the work, and I I definitely have had people I wouldn't sell to because I I don't want my baby living in their home, dear God. I, uh, but um, I I should be better at that. Uh, but I, I I don't. I guess I. Um, this gentleman in the pink shirt. Yes, my question is more to you as a journalist than as an artist. Um, with the with an, a new trend in some portions of uh, liberal Western discourse, so you've got people like Sam Harris, let's say, or Bill Maher, who say things like they need to empower uh, former Muslims in order to somehow uh, rehabilitate the rest of us. So, I, I'm paraphrasing here. Yeah. So would you say then that for, for many of us when, when statements come out like this, 
who try to say that we should strike a conciliatory tone with the West. Um, our relatives who tell us that there is, let's say we are heading towards a clash of civilizations or something, things become very difficult for us. So is it true, should we as um, moderates in, Pakistan, in places like Pakistan for instance, decide to pick a side here and are we just too different to coexist or to have our voices heard or for uh, to have a voice is tolerated. This is one question. The second question is um, related to the role of artists in, let's say, supporting demagogues, for instance. Like art about uh, Vladimir Putin, for lack of a better example. So he is a comic book hero in Russia. So what role would you say artists have and what and how should pa artists in Pakistan avoid doing that to any one of our political figures? God, these are two great questions. Um, first is, if the two civilizations we have to choose from in this world are like the Taliban and Bill Maher, dear God, can I have like a spaceship to Mars? This is, <laughs> and, and why would Bill Maher, Bill Maher, of all people think that he was the one to, to liberate Muslim women? Or is anyone looking to Bill Maher in this world? Bill Maher doesn't know anything. Uh, he's, he's in, in my opinion, he's racist. I am um, not allowed on his show because I told his booker that he was an Islamophobe and I would tell him to his face. And I, um, I think that there could be no one less relevant to discourse in the Muslim world than Bill Maher. And um, I think that the problem is that um, we don't have in America, in, in many ways, enough Muslims on television and enough Muslims in mainstream media for there to be the full um, diversity of opinions shown. And, and not just Muslims, but atheists from Muslim countries or religious minorities from Muslim countries. When there gets to be only one person who's in the minority group, then that person gets to speak, you know, speaks for everyone, regardless of whether they, or not they want to. And no one person can occupy that role. And in terms of this class of, class of civilization thing, I mean, you and I are here, right? And um, we haven't thrown javelons at each other yet. Um, though a drone did try to attack me, so maybe I don't, maybe it was one of, one of my sides, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I think that this is, I think that the real clash of civilizations is the clash of civilizations between um, idiots who want narrow worlds built on fictionalized histories of purity um, that are worshipping of authority on one hand and people who want open societies on the other. That, that, is, that are the civilizations that are clashing. It's not people who are Muslim and Christian and atheist and Jewish. It's not that. It's, it's something quite different. Um, as for the second question, oh God, yeah, artists have, uh, I mean, all you have to do is Google, Google the term propaganda poster and you can see a million artists who have drawn, you know, the square-jawed uh, Nazi or the, 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 the square-jawed fascist. I mean, I think the, the first thing is probably um, don't uh, draw flattering pictures of um, generals after they take over the government. You might regret it later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the second thing is probably, I think that one tendency um, that we as artists um, must constantly check in ourselves is we, we want heroes for our stories, right? We want like the noble person to look at. But once you make heroes, heroes can betray you so terribly. And, and heroes are not a, a, not a true thing. You know, people are not heroes. No one, no one is heroes. There are, are very, very brave people. There are people who have done extraordinary things. But no one is that sort of plaster square-jawed figure that a few men get to be. And so I, I suggest we stop manufacturing heroes, full stop. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here. And it's an absolute honor to have you here with us today. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask was, like you mentioned, and this is a question I believe I, I speak for a lot of people when I say this, is, was the concept of this silent, moderate majority a sham? Is it now we're living in a world because we see the Brexit, we see the situation in Gaza, like in the States, is it that the actual majority sentiment of the world right now, as in the public, is towards fascism? And has the moderates been reduced to a minority right now? And that silent majority does not exist? This is something I think a lot about in um in the context of America and the context of other countries. And um, I don't know if it's anything that someone has um, concrete answers in. So I'll just say like what, gives, what makes me feel better, for what that's worth. 24% of America, of American voters, not America, of American voters voted for Trump, 24%. Slightly more voted for Clinton than voted for Trump, 3 million more. 
But 50% of the country didn't, who could vote didn't. And why didn't they vote? They didn't vote because neither candidate gave them something that was good enough for them to take the extra unpleasant hours to drive someplace and stand online after they worked all day. And I deeply blame those 24% of people who voted for Trump. I do not excuse it for economic anxiety, which is the popular uh, sentiment in America. I don't think that um, it's all right to vote in racist laws because you think it will give you economic advantages. If anything, I think that makes it worse. But the fact that 50% or nearly 50% of people didn't vote, that's on everyone. That's on both parties for running candidates that on one side were so deeply repellent and on the other side were so deeply uninspiring that so many people couldn't even bother to get up. And I think if there's a real silent majority in the world, it's not, the silent major it's not a silent majority of fascists, it's a silent majority of people who cannot be bothered. I want to talk a, a, a different type of question. I want to know about that uh, you are, at the same time, you are a journalist, you are an artist. How can you sonify yourself? But you are more, you are more journalist or more artist? And second question is that, how many you have been here in Pakistan and you don't, uh, you didn't explain uh, about Lahore, Lahori people, Lahori food, etc. And what have you experienced here in recent days? Well, the, the first question is I'm, I'm more of an artist and that's because I've been drawing since I was four years old and not a single day passes where I don't draw. And um, I had a kind of hand injury um, that kept me from drawing properly uh, for a bit and I was so angry. I was like, it's like useless meat. How would you betray me, you know? Uh, so I think that um, probably art is the part of my being that can't be cut off. In terms of Lahore, I um, regret not commenting more on Lahore, but I arrived um, at 1 a.m. Um, the day before yesterday. So I, um, I've seen the, the Shish Mahal and I've seen, your, I've seen you know, the, the beauty of the old city, but I felt that if I, if I started commenting, I would just be speaking ignorantly. However, I'm staying for another week, so um, I hope to learn so much more and um, have a sketchbook full of things that I can, that I can publish afterwards. Uh, my, my question is, we, the people are living in a country which is so used to the rule of demagogues and autocrats who, you know, uh, punish their, their artists by blaming them in fake quotes and jailing them for years and years. We're changing in a sense that uh, uh, last year a, a, we, we actually honored a great scientist of our country who we very, for, for long, ignored him. We're changing for a positive. But what we see in the West and in the United States of America is they're changing for, for bad, for worse. For uh, what is the reason behind this? What do you think is undergoing process which has uh, come in this form for the world? I can speak most knowledgeably about America here. Um, America, you know, had 50 years as um, the, um, you know, the, the head of global hegemony, and that's clearly chipping away. The world is clearly shifting to Asia. And also, America is a deeply white supremacist country. And it built, was built on that, it was built on enslaving people, it was built on genocide against the natives. And that also is chipping away in very, very tiny ways. And so these two things, the um, feeling that like, even though life is objectively much better, you know, for, um, the vast majority of Americans than it is for much of the world, that they're not the, the most powerful. And then the feeling by um, many white people that even though they are still the most powerful, they're slightly, a little bit like less the most powerful than they were 50 years ago. These, these feelings of um, slipping and of resentment are I think powering extremely, extremely, extremely negative um, things and that they're powering this um, desire for a daddy figure who's going to like swaddle them up in a blanket and say, I'll make America white again for you. Though I want to say something very important about America. My mother, my mother is 70 years old. Her and her friends have been out on the streets nearly every day in the cold protesting against Donald Trump. Every one of my friends has been out nearly every day protesting against Donald Trump. 
When the Muslim ban was enacted, hundreds of New Yorkers went out to JFK, which is our terrible, terrible airport out in the middle of nowhere, and, um, which is quite militarized. And they stood there and they protested and they protested until a judge was willing to hear uh, the case. And that was what started uh, the overturning of the Muslim ban. Americans are in the streets every day, and not just in New York, not just in liberal enclaves, everywhere. They're in the streets. Um, and I think that, I always think when I am marching, that maybe it won't work, maybe it will, I don't know. But I want there to be a record to the rest of the world that we are in the streets and with our bodies, we are showing that this, this orange donkey does not represent us. Over there, in the back. Thank you so much. I was really interested when you said that you, um, after your work in Abu Dhabi, you can no longer go in transit through Dubai. And obviously, you can't go on certain television shows either. And I wondered um, what the response of sort of authorities and governments have been to your work, and whether you've been subjected to any of Trump's Twitter rants at all. Well, I, I suppose the most um, negative American thing that I got was um, after I wrote about Guantanamo Bay, the uh, press officers were very, very angry at me and you know, called up my boss and berated me. They, they said that I made them look like tools. I, I don't know what else you would call someone who's the PR man at Guantanamo, but they felt very hurt. Um, in terms of governmental things, you know, I haven't, um, I have not actually had, um, had any pushback um, from Trump and, you know, God willing, right? But um, I don't know. It's a very, it's a very uncertain thing. But the thing is, I think um, instead of, I guess, like fearing about whether or not I, I'll have pushback, I, I try to focus my stuff more on the people who I know will have pushback, like uh, people, my, my friends who are undocumented, for instance, or um, you know, my friends who you know fear leaving America because they're green card holders from one of the seven countries that Trump is trying to prohibit. I think. Um, that it's better often to um, focus on the people that you know are um, at risk and you know are, are being harmed than to focus on um, anxiety for yourself if you don't know that you're in one of those groups. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I just want to ask a question. Uh, you're talking, uh, the title is about the fascism. As Leon Trotsky said about fascism that it is a distilled essence of the filth of capitalism and uh, what is your opinion about uh, that uh, Trump is a manifestation of all the evils and the filth of the uh, capitalism and uh, there was a huge campaign around Bernie Sanders who was talking about socialism and a political revolution inside the US and he's got a marvelous response until he was fraudulently pushed out of the race by the Democrats and the, those uh, backing the Hillary Clinton. So what is your opinion that uh, how capitalism can be overthrown in United States and through a socialist revolution and how it can have an impact all over the world. There's a reason people don't ask artists for military strategies. But yes, I was a Bernie bro. I have to say I loved Bernie Sanders and um, the way that he um, was really conspired against and uh, thwarted by the DNC is something that in many ways is uh, responsible for um, Hillary Clinton's loss, and uh, I will say it now, I will say it forever, Bernie would have won. Uh, how capitalism can be overthrown in the US, I, I don't know if that's, you know, I don't, I don't know how I would do that. However, I think a better goal for us perhaps would be to go towards the sort of um, humane democratic socialism that Bernie Sanders represents. I would also caution that Trump is a distilled manifestation of certain sectors of capital, but not of all sectors. There are sectors of capital that deeply want open borders, that, um, deeply want um, to have a lot of Indian guest workers, um, you know, working at technology firms and that want there to be um, immigrants uh, from Mexico who, who have no documents and thus no labor rights. You know, a lot of capital really benefits off of that. But it's just the capital, um, like everything else, is not a monolith. And I think that Trump's election in some ways represents a war between uh, the sectors of capital that are nativist and the sectors of capital that are globalist. Should we take some more questions or not? Yes. Is, is there time? If there's time, well, I'll talk forever. We have, we have some questions. Have minutes. Can, can, I have a question? can I have a question from a woman? One more question. Uh, uh, I want to ask uh, a question. 
and the uh, West, uh, especially USA, uh, has promoted democracy. It has promoted economic liberalism. It has promoted globalization. However, with the election of uh, Donald Trump, he is showing anti-globalization. He wants to contain China. Uh, I want to ask that uh, what you promoted, now you are going to demote it. You are going to abrogate it. Now, what is the reason behind going anti-globalization? Thank you. So I always think of America as um, a country that reminds me of a woman who gets restorative surgery on her hymen to be a virgin again. I don't think anyone, any country can lose its innocence as often as America has. It forgets its history every four years and uh, thinks that it's like redo, redo. So, you know, for a long time, America benefited a lot from globalization, but it also brought a lot of um, discontents to it. You know, a lot of areas of the country have been economically gutted by globalization. And so, you know, when a four-year cycle rolls around, America doesn't, I mean, those people don't remember what America said. They, we have no attention span. They're like, they're like, man, my, my plant moved away to Mexico, or um, there, are, you know, there, there are no jobs here. They moved away to China, and they want to change that. They want to change things at their immediate concern. They don't care about grand narratives that America's always pushed. And also, they don't care about lies that America has already told, because America, you know, they talk about democracy, but I think we, we actually know what a, America's uh, global uh, democracy promotion has meant. Um, as we wind up, is there something that you were not asked, that you were dying to tell us or dying to say? Um, you know, you have your 60 seconds to say it in. Oh. <laughs> Mostly I'm just, I'm so honored to be here. And you know, I am, um, for me, it's, it's very um, meaningful to be here. I, I'm just going to be a, a gushing artist for a second. I would always look at Lahore in um, Islamic art history books when I was a teenager, and I would always be like, man, I want to go there. And I, I never had the opportunity before, and this is my first time. So it's, um, it's actually a bit of a dream for me to be here. And um, I just want to thank you for having me in your beautiful city. And thank you very much. And I hope that you'll make a habit of coming back to Lahore. Thank you, Malik. You're amazing. Thank you so much. That was such an honor. <laughs>